We begin with the last three lines in Daflam and Zion. The is discussing somebody who redeemed an Eved that was captured. And if the first owner, the original owner, was Miyayish, gave a Pope and never getting him back, a relinquished ownership, and the person who redeemed him can become the owner. So Mara wants to know, how was he kind of, where, where is the Kenyan? He just redeemed him from captivity. So the Gemara says he was kind of him by purchasing him from the captors. So Gemara says, but how did the captors own him? The captors, of course, are Oivdi Kachavim themselves. And how was an Oivdi Kachavim allowed to own an Eved? Where do you ever see such a concept that an Oivdi Kachavim can own an Eved of Pihalacha? Gemara says, yeah, he can. Even though he cannot own the guf, he cannot own the body of the Eved, he can own the handiwork, the produce that the Eved works and creates. The Gemara shows that. The Gemara quotes Rishlakish, who says, yeah, but Joshua, how do you know that an Oved Kichavim who purchases another Oved Kichavim for his handiwork, that is, he purchases just his work, that that purchase works? He quotes a passage that says, Vigami bnei toshav magarmi imacha mehem tiknu oisam mehem tiknu atem kainam mehem vahem kainam mehem. So it says that you can purchase the people who live in the land before you arrive there, meaning you can purchase an Eved from the seven nations that lived in Eretz Yisrael before Kal Yisrael captured it. So the Joshua is, you can purchase them, but they cannot purchase you. So that means an Eved Kichavim cannot purchase a Yisrael, and they cannot purchase each other. Only Yisrael can purchase an Eved Kichavim. So says the Gemara, so you may think that they can't purchase each other, and therefore I'm going to say, you may think they can't purchase each other. He just said that they can't purchase each other. So the Gemara says, no, you may think they can't purchase each other at all, Therefore, we're going to show you they can't purchase each other. They cannot own the body of the Evid, but they can own the work of the Evid. Where do you see that? Because they have a couple of And Evid Chavim could purchase the handiwork of a Yisrael. And therefore, he could certainly purchase the handiwork of another Evid Chavim. Now, where do you see that a Evid Chavim can purchase the handiwork of a Yisrael and purchase the Yisrael for his handiwork? So the Gemara doesn't say, Rashi quotes, Okay, so you therefore you see that an Avichavim can purchase another Avichavim just for his produce, for his work. So he can't own the body, but he can't own the work. So the Gemara says, therefore, that could be what's happening over here. The second master, the person who redeemed them, purchased the Masidayim from the captor. So the Gemara says, well, hold on a second. But you can only purchase, we've, we've only learned that you could purchase it with money. Because we learned out of a Kavachomer of an Avichav and purchasing Yisrael. An Avichav can only purchase Yisrael with money. Here there's no Kenyan of money. The captor didn't pay for the Evid. He grabbed the Evid and he maybe he made him work. So that's what's called the Kenyan Chazaka. Grabbing someone, making them work, that's a Kenyan Chazaka. How do you see that there's a Kenyan Chazaka of an Avichav on an Avichav? You only see that there's a Kenyan Kesef of an Avichav on an Avichav. So that Gemara answers because we have a Halacha that Amun Umayev Tiru Besichon. Kaisa were not allowed to attack Amun and Moiv because of a treaty that was made between Avram Avinu and Avi Melech. Yet they did attack those lands, and that's because they belonged to Sichon. So Sichon had taken over those lands from them. And had it Sichon, that means that Sichon must have owned those lands. And had it Sichon and his people take control over those lands, they didn't buy them, they captured them. So you see that Chazaka is able to capture land, and the halachos of Eved and land are the same. We have a Hekish that links Avadim to land. So says the Gemara, so that's true, and I'm purchasing an Avikachavim, can an Avikachavim also purchase a Yisrael with Chazaka? So the Gemara says yes, because it says, Vayish Mimenu Shevi, when it's talking about the conquest of Klai Yisrael by the king of Arad, and therefore you see that that is a possibility. The Gemara now brings Allah said by Hashem and Abba in the name of Yechelan, he says that if an Eved runs away from captivity, he's captive, just like we've been discussing the last while, he was caught by captors, and then he runs away, he escapes. So says with Shemin Bar Abba, he goes free. He doesn't have to go back to serve his original owner. Not only that, we force the original owner to write a good shikha for him so that he can have proof that he's free and even marry Abbas Yisro. So the Gemara Kasha that this contradicts our Mishnah. Our Mishnah had said that Rosh Hashem ben Gamliel says that in a case where the Eved was caught by a captors and he's redeemed, that he has to still go back and work. Now we say he has to go back and work for the first owner. So the halacha there, according to Rebbechanan, is like a Shimon ben Gamliel. Because Rabbi Rebbechanan quotes Rebbechanan, who says that any place where Shimon ben Gamliel is mentioned in the Mishnah, the halacha is like him, except for three 
cases called Erev Tzidon and Raya Charna, none of these, meaning in this case the halacha is like Rav Shemim Gamliel, and therefore Rav Yechanan, who holds that the Rav Shemim Gamliel has to hold that the Evid goes back to work for his original owner, and here we're saying, Rav Shemim Bar Abbas quoting Rav Yechanan, who's saying that if he escapes, he goes free, so why should that be? He should go back to work for the original owner. So the Gemara says, well, let's look into what case the Mishnah was talking about. We had a Machalik of Bayan Rava. Going to Bayan Rava, our case is talking about where the original owner was, our Mishnah was talking about where the original owner was not Miyayish. He still retains ownership. So I have no kasha. I could say, the Mishnah is talking about the original owner was not Miyayish. There, the original owner re- retains ownership. And if the Evid is redeemed, he has to go back to his original owner. If Shem Barab here is talking about where the original owner was Miyayish, he gave a Pope. He's not the owner anymore. He is free. However, according to Rava, that the case of our mission was talking about where the owner was Miyash. And the reason he has to go back to work according to Rav and Ben and Gamil is because of Xeru, we're afraid he's going to go and have himself be caught to try to escape. Therefore, we say that he doesn't escape. So in the mission is talking about where there already was Yish, how, and still he has to go back to work. In our case of Rav and Bar Abba, the best he could be doing is where there was Yish, he should still say he has to go work. How come he goes free? So Rav answers and says, no, there's a reason he goes free, because the entire Xera that we're afraid that he may go put himself into prison, have himself be caught on purpose in order to escape, doesn't apply. Because he went and he escaped by escaping from his captors, he put his life at risk. So it can't be that he went through this entire plot. No one's going to plot like that. And therefore, that concern that he got himself caught on purpose doesn't exist. Therefore, it's okay to say that in this case, he can go free. And there's no chance he's going to do it on purpose. In that case, in the case of our Mishnah, though, there, if we would let him go free, then people get themselves caught and have themselves be redeemed. The Gemara number is an incident. The Gemara says the maidservant of Mar Shmuel was captured, and some people went and redeemed her with intent and that she should stay in servitude. So they sent a message to Mar Shmuel. They sent her back to Mar Shmuel, and they said as follows. They said, first of all, we hold like Rav Shimon ben Gamliel, that whenever someone redeems... The Eved, in this case, the Amma, has to go back to serve the original owner. Now, even if you hold like the Rabbanon, the Rabbanon held that the Halacha was that they don't have to go back to serve the original owner. That's only if the second people redeemed her in order to set her free. But you should know that we redeemed her in order to have her stay as an Eved. And therefore, we're sending her back to you to stay as the original Eved. Says Gemara, they were assuming that Shmuel was not Miyayish. Shmuel was not Miyayish, and they have to go back to serve the original owner according to the Rabbanon. However, that's not the case. The case was the original owner was Meish. Shmuel was Meish. And therefore, he didn't own her any longer. And therefore, he set her free. And now that he set her free, he said that she doesn't require a get shakhar. She can have full freedom without requiring a get shakhar. As Shmuel holds elsewhere, someone who makes his Evet Hefker, ownerless, he goes free and does not require a get shakhar because there is no shame Evet. He's fully allowed to marry Yisrael. The shame Evet doesn't exist anymore. Where do you see that? Because the Torah defines an Eved as Eved Ish Miknas Kesef. So why do you call him an Eved Ish, the Eved of a man? It's only Eved of a man, not the Eved of a woman? It says, well, no, that's not what it means. It means an Eved who has an owner. An Eved who doesn't have an owner is not an Eved. The, the name, if he's Hefker, he doesn't remain an Eved without an owner. It's not just thing as an Eved without an owner. An Eved without an owner is a free man. And therefore, she goes free fully in this case, and there is no issue. The one that brings another incident, the Gemara says that the Amma, the maidservant of Rabbi Abba, Bar Zutra was also captured, and he was redeemed by a Evekechavim from Tarmud, and he wanted to marry her, this Evekechavim. So the Chachamim sent a message to Rabbi Abba Bar Zutra that the right thing to do is to send this Amma a Get Shechor, a Shtar of Freedom. So Mar asks why. What's the situation? Was it possible that he would be able to redeem her from this Tarmuda or not? Was he willing to return her to him in exchange for money or not? So either way, we have a problem. If you say that he was willing to return her in exchange for the money, so then why should he give a get or let him just redeem her? And if the guy was not willing to return her for money, so then what's the point in giving her her freedom? She's stuck under the control of the guy. She can't marry anybody anyway. So what's the function of it? So the Gemara answer is, Either way, you could explain it. I could tell you that um, he was willing to redeem her. Um, the problem was that nobody else wanted to redeem her. If he would set her free, meaning the the Tarmuda was willing to accept redemption from her. Rabbi Abba necessarily didn't have the money. But if he would send her to she would be free. Then other people from the town would be willing to redeem her because she'd be marriageable, she'd be free. 
now that she's still his Ebed, no one had a reason to redeem her. The other answer the Gemara says is that it could be that the guy was not willing to accept money exchange for her, but if you would send a get Shekhar and she become free, then he wouldn't want her anymore. Because it would be embarrassing for him that he took as a wife a person who was an Amma to Yisrael. So Gemara asks, is that true? But we say that the behema of a Yisrael is more dear to an Avi Kechavim than his own wife. So the Gemara says that's only in secret. But here where it would be publicly known that the woman he was marrying was an Amma of Yisrael, it would be embarrassing for him and he would not be willing to do it. The Gemara now continues with another incident. The Gemara says there was another Amma. This one we don't know who the uh, original owner was, but she lived in Pompadisa, and she was available for people to be doing Isurim with. She was serving as a Mikshal, people were being every Isurim with her. So the Gemara says that Abaye said that if not for the fact that Yehuda said the name of Shmuel, that it is forbidden to set an Eved free. Anybody who sets him free violates an Isur of the Elam Bahem Tavaydu. He should serve forever. So it says it would have forced her owner to set her free. That way she'll be able to marry a Yisrael. And the Yisrael, if she has a husband, he will make sure that she maintains appropriate behavior. So Gemara says that um, Ravina did not agree. Ravina said, no, even Rabbi Hudu would agree here that in order to prevent this from happening, it's permitted to set her free. The Gemara asks, could, is it true that Abai himself didn't hold that way? We have an incident that happened with Rav Chanina Barkatina who says the name of Yitzhak, there was a story that happened with a woman who somehow ended up being half an Eved, half a Shivcha, that is, and half a Bas Chayrin. And Rabba, who was by his Rebbe, forced her half-owner to set her free. And Rav Yitzhak, and Rav Nachman Bar Yitzchak said, and the reason that she was being set free there was because she was a uh, Hefker. She was being used for Yisur. So the Gemara says, so there you see that we do set her free, even in a situation where she's an Eved, or she's a Shevcha, because we want to prevent these rooms. So why would a Bayi say otherwise? So the Gemara says, that's different. That's because she was half Eved, half Baschar, and she couldn't marry anybody. She couldn't marry an Eved because she was half Baschar, and she couldn't marry a Bas, uh, Ben Chayrin because she was half Shevcha. So in order... There was no solution. However, in our situation with this lady, there was a solution because she could at least marry an Eved. Her husband, her owner could uh, identify a specific Eved who would be her spouse. And now the Gemara refers to the halacha where we said that it's forbidden to release an Eved. Altogether, the Gemara says, Rabbi Yehud said, you're no, not allowed to. It says, let him have I do. So the Gemara asks, but there was an incident where Rabbi Eliezer came to the shul and there was only nine people for the minion. So he freed his Eved, and then he became a full-fledged Yisrael, so that he could be a member of the Minions. I was allowed to do that. So my answer is, in order to fulfill the mitzvah, that was permitted. In Mark Kotzer Baisa, that brings the Machlech Sanayim, whether there is an answer to free an Eved at all or not. Although the Pasuk says, La'ayim bem tevaydu, it should serve you forever, Rabbi Shmuel says that that is not and Isser. The only Behem Tavayit was saying that it's permitted for them to serve you, it's permitted to own an Eved, even if his mother is from the seven nations of Canaan. We were not supposed to allow any of them to live, but if we did allow one of them to live, and then she has a child from someone from a different nation, it is permitted to own that child as an Eved. So the Gemara says that that's why Rabbi Shemal understands that it's saying, which is not saying that there's an Isser to free an Eved, it's just saying that it's permitted to keep the Eved. And Rikifi says, no, one is not allowed to free an Eved from uh, Kinan. So the Gemara therefore asks, so why do we say that Rebbe Lazar says that you're allowed to free just for a mitzvah, and that's why he freed his Eved to complete the minion? Maybe he just held like Rabbi Shmuel, that you're always allowed to free an Eved, and it's only a Rishus. So Rishus says, no, you can't answer that. We have a Brisa where Rabbi Lazar says explicitly that it's an obligation, that it's a chavah. He learns like Rabbi Akiva. Okay, says Rabbi, there are three things which cause people to lose their their possessions. One is that they send their avadim free. The second is that they uh, tour their property on Shabbos to see what work it needs. That is a type of chal Shabbos to be thinking about such things on Shabbos. And the third is that they make their sudas Shabbos at the time when the Chacham is giving the drasha. They're not supposed to be having the Shabbos, and they're supposed to be listening to the drasha. Zubchibar Abba 
It says in Rabbi Yechanan, there were two families in Yerushalayim. One made a tzuda on Shabbos during the height of time. One made a tzuda on Erev Shabbos, and therefore didn't have an appetite for Shabbos. Both of them did not continue. It says Rabbah in the name of Rav. Now we have a machogis between Rabbah in the name of Rav and Rabbi Yechanan in the name of Rav. Machogis is what did Rav say, but either way they're similar things. According to Rabbah, he says, somebody who's a maktish in Eved, he says, my Eved should be hektish, the Eved goes free. When to be he says, somebody who's a mafkir, he says, my Eved should be onerless, that Eved goes free. Now, onerless and being set free are not the same thing automatically, but Rav Yosef is saying that Rav said they are. If it doesn't have an owner, then he's free, as we said it earlier. Now, why should maktish mean set free? So the word says, because maktish, what could it mean? If it means kedushas haguf, that would, it could be a carbon, so obviously it cannot, because... Uh, Evid cannot be a carbon. Now, it could mean monetary kedusha that it belongs to hektish, but, and that's what it means if it was a non kosher animal, but uh, we don't assume that that's what it means because he didn't say that. He didn't say its value should go to hektish, the value of the savage should belong to hektish. Instead, he said makdish. So he could mean that I'm sanctifying the body of the Evid, that it means to say that I'm making it a full fledged Yisro. And therefore, what he's saying is that it should be Yisro, meaning it should be set free. So you have this Mechokis, what did Rav say? So the Gemara says, is it really Mechokis or do they agree to each other? So the Gemara says, the one who says Makdish certainly would agree to Hefker because Makdish is Hefker plus. And Makdish, you may even say that he didn't mean, you could possibly think he didn't mean that he should become Kadosh Yisrael. He meant it should be belong to Hektish. Yet he doesn't say that. He says that he's set free. So he would certainly say that Mafkir is set free. However, the one who said Mafkir would not necessarily agree to Kadosh. Kadosh, he could assume that he's saying that it belongs to Hektish. Lumerna asks, is a get Shichur required? Does he have to be freed? Or is he free enough he can marry a Bas Yisrael under these circumstances. So the Mara says, let's bring a proof. Chibar Oven said name of Rav, both cases he goes free, but he does require a get shecher. So now Rav says we have a kash on what we said. We said that somebody who's makdish and Eved, the Eved goes free. We have a brisa that says if somebody's makdish all his property and there are vadim among them, they don't belong fully to Hektish. Hektish doesn't own the guf. Hektish can't own the guf of anything unless it has Kedusha Sagov. But Evid can't have Kedusha Sagov because he's not really the carbon. So therefore, Hektish only owns the value. And he can't keep an Evid if you own only the value. But what Hektish could do is sell the Evid. And then that other person who receives it gives its value to Hektish. So Hektish gets money for him. And then that person can set him free or could do whatever he wants with him. So you see here clearly that uh, your Makdish and Evid. He belongs to Hektish. You don't assume that he goes free automatically. So why do we say that he goes free? So the Gemara says further, Rabbi Yudhanasi also says that even if he just wants to redeem himself, he could redeem himself from Hektish. Because it's as if he's being sold to himself. So either way, the kasha is, why would we say that he goes free? So the Gemara answers, it's not a problem. We're quoting Rav here. Rav sometimes is viewed as a Tana who can argue on a Brisa or a Mishnah. So there's more you might say that here, but now we have a kasha that you can't say that. We have a kasha where a brysa brings a pasuk that says that um, one who frees in, uh, one who's makdish and eved becomes hektish. It says, achal um somebody who's makdish may adam, elu avada v'shiv chayzev that one could be makdish, his avadam and his shiv chayzev. So Gemara says, so here you see clearly there's a Pasuk that says it. So the Pasuk says, Rav can't argue on the Pasuk. So Gemara says, no, this is different. This is talking about where he explicitly says that he's Makdish for its value. He's Makdish its value. Rav was just saying, if somebody's Makdish, we assume he didn't mean value. We assume he meant Am Kadesh. They should become a full-fledged Yisrael. But if he said explicitly, I'm Makdish for its value. So then he owes the value to Hektish. So Gemara says, okay, but if that's true, how come we didn't answer that in previous Brysa? Why do you want to say he argues on the Brysa before? Why don't you say that Brysa is also talking about his Makdash's value? So Gemara says, the Brysa wouldn't make sense if his Makdash's value. His Makdash's value, the effort doesn't belong to Hektish. Just the person who is Makdash owes that value, that amount of money to Hektish. So it would be meant when it says that the uh, Gizborim, the people who take care of Hektish, can send him to freedom by selling him to others. There, there is no gizbarim on him. There's just money that's owed. What does he say? You sell him to others? You can't sell him to others. It doesn't belong to Hektish. 
And you say he could redeem himself, he doesn't have to redeem himself. It doesn't belong to Hektish. All he did was pledge the value to Hektish. That has nothing to do with this. So, says the Gemara, um, there are additional proofs on this question, which we will get to on the next step.